Well, I'm, um, I'm just floored with, uh, with being here in London. Um, Looker's about six years old, and um, uh, just seeing the growth and the, and the enthusiasm for, for, for what it is. And um, who, who here programs in LookML? Yeah, wow, OK. So the, the, um, there's very, when you wake up and you decide what you're going to spend your, your time doing each day, um, that, that, that's a choice about where you want to spend your attention. And that, that um, we ask, using Looker is a, uh, is a big ask. We're asking you to learn a new language. And that you're willing to take that time and invest in something as strange as a new programming language that's invented by a company in California. I, I just, I'm floored and thankful for all of you to, to have done it. I'm going to talk today about uh, the importance of language. Um, oh, I've got a clicker. <laughs> Um, language is the founding thesis of Looker. Um, the, the, the core of Looker is about language. And I'm going to talk today about how I think about language and how um, maybe that will help you in, in thinking about what you're doing with, with, in data with language. Um, so there, there are basically three levels of language that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about human language, the way we interact with each other and communicate. Um, I'm going to talk about computer languages, um, like LookML. And um, I'm also going to talk about business language, which are languages that you use to, to, to run your businesses. Um, um, so um, there's a, a philosopher na uh, named Noam Chomsky. I don't know who's familiar with him, but he's great. He's, he has these theories around languages. And the, one of the core theories on language um, that he has is that ideas or, or, or thoughts are language, and language are thoughts. That without words, you really can't express a thought. And that your ideas are formulated in words. And so that, that there's a, a very tight correlation between words and language. And um, um, uh, I'll, I'll use one to illustrate. Uh, so um, I have two words for snow, slush and powder. Well, and snow, maybe three words for snow, OK? Slush, slush powder, and snow, right? The, I can describe it in three ways. Um, but when I was growing up, there was some legend around, you know, my, somebody once said to me, you know, Eskimos have 21 words for snow. And, um, and then I thought that was not true. And then, I, I, and then it was like an internet thing. And then it turns out that there are actually 50 words for snow that they have. And they use those 50 words to very carefully describe their environment and the nuances of their environment because those words are really, are, are, are really important because if it's slushy rain outside, you better wear something warmer than if it's powdery snow then you can, and sunny, then you can probably do better with it. And I, we don't need the, that many words, but they need that many words to, to deal with their environment and to deal with what they're doing. So the, the, the different languages are great at expressing different things. I'm in Europe, so French is supposed to be the language of love, and German is supposed to be the language of precision. I don't know if this is true. I don't speak either, sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the idea here is that, um, that our words, um, the words connote a lot of meaning, and the rearranging of those words actually make ideas. Um, in computers, um, I'm going to take you a little bit through computer history, but I think computer history is best explained through language. Um, when, when computers were first starting, there were these big machines that had toggles on the front, and you toggle the switches in to boot, to boot up the computer. Um, and so the, 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 originally, computers were really down with hardwiring or, or switches. Um, and then very early, very quickly, what they developed was something called an assembly language, which is each processor had um, um, a different uh, instruction set, and that there would be shorthand English for each of the instruction set, and then some numbers that would follow. And you would, you would feed this to a program um, uh, called an assembler, and it would take that and convert it into machine code. And for a long time, that's how different processors were programmed. Um, and then um, in the 60s, um, uh, Bell Labs, um, which uh, was a, a great think tank for computers, and a lot of our early computer science came from there, um, uh, a language called C was developed. And C um, was a, a universal programming language for all processors. So it was a language that could express everything that you could do in assembly language. Um, and what was cool about that is that you could write a program in C, and then it would convert it to assembler, and then it would get, and then it, it would be assembled, and then you could run that code on any processor. So it, it, it created a, a universal way of talking to computers. And in fact, that universal way of talking to computers is still how most operating systems are written. Most operating systems are written in C. The first thing that you do when you make a new processor is you make a C compiler for it. So, and then there are higher level languages that go on top of that. So like C++ is C with some new ideas. And Java is is basically C with garbage collection and with uh, uh, object orientation. 
and, and so on. And then new languages crop up, which are like agile programming languages, which, are, which again, are higher levels of abstraction that, that have different ideas. So like Go has, is, is great about distributed processing, and PHP is good for web programming. And, and, and so these ideas are expressed in language. Let's talk about SQL. So SQL, let's talk about what happened before SQL. Before SQL, um, uh, we had COBOL, basically, and we had, file, we, had, we had programs that talked to files on hard disks or on, on tape. Right? And, and what would happen is, is that we had um, these, these programs didn't talk to each other. They, had, they all talked to their own data in a, in a certain way, in, in, in just by reading and writing from files. And there was no universal way of accessing the data. So at IBM, Cotton Day figured out this language called SQL, which was a standard way of writing data in a reliable way, but also a standard way of reading and relating it in a standard way. And over the next, oh, I don't know, 20 years, they, uh, all of the things that you could express in relational algebra ended up in SQLs. And we ended up with a standard SQL. Um, but unfortunately, over time, we didn't get the new things like object orientation or distributed computing. Or we ended up with just SQL. Um, and SQL has some problems. Um, you know, the, the, I, the, like assembly language doesn't express objects, right? Um, in, C, in SQL, uh, we don't express ideas very well. We can actually query the data. We can write the, the data reliably. We can query the data reliably. But we can't build higher levels of uh, abstraction in it. So, Look ML, which is my thesis about language and data, is that, um, or our thesis actually, um, that um, is that uh, Look ML is based on SQL, like C++ or, or Java is based on, on, on C, but what it does is it makes a definitive, it allows you to build definitive measures, it builds, build a layer of measures and dimensions that are definitive. So the idea here being that if you have revenue net of shipping, in one place in your model, it appears ex that definition appears exactly one place, not in 15 different SQL queries. Right? It appears one place in your model and can be reused everywhere. Whether you're looking at it by sales rep or by region or by date or by, uh, by um, lead source or by that measure is computed exactly the same way and reliably regardless and is only expressed in one place. And if you're going to build a transformation, say you want to compute customer lifetime value with, with net of shipping. Um, you, could, you can build a query and, re, and, and manifest that table back to the database in a way that is reliable and built off the same definitions. And so that's, that's the thesis about what LookML is about. It's about building, it's about building new language. And so um, um, the, the, and the language that we're going to try to build is the language of business. Now, my grandfather uh, immigrated to the United States in... Um, uh, around 1900, and he was one of the first certified public accountants. I think you guys call them chartered accountants, is that right? Yeah. And so um, um, a certified public accountant at the time, was, so he was like in the, in the, in the tw early 20s, 1920s. You have to remember what was going on then was like the first Wall Street run-up was happening, and, um, or the first the, Wall Street was starting to really form itself. And what, he, what, what they developed then, they were economists essentially, because Calculators, people who did calculations were, were called calculators. They were the people who added up the numbers. But the people who were trying to figure out how to measure things, like what you guys were doing, they were the certified public accountants who were trying to figure out how to build measures. And what they were trying to build, like current assets and, um, and uh, total cost of goods sold and all the ideas that we think about in accounting, and, to, and um, those ideas were, were being developed so that they could compare companies. So within an industry, how were these two companies compared? They, they had to compute the things the same way. So they were coming up with a language that was designed so that companies could be used to compare each other. Right? That's the, that was the main purpose of, of accounting. Um, and we've been able to compute that stuff since then. right? So we have had tools that have been able to compute these kinds of things for a long time. And you don't necessarily need Looker for that. Looker's good at this, but you don't necessarily need it for this. Um, um, the kind of measures that I'm going to talk about are the ones that actually change your business. And are, so um, who's ever started a new job, and then when they got to the new job, people were talking about measures that they had no idea what they meant, right? Okay. <laughs> so um, before Looker, I was the CTO of a company called LiveOps, and we were the first home-based call center, first crowdsource company, actually. And we, were the we had 30,000 home-based telephone operators. And these operators worked out of their houses, and they answered calls for TV commercials, basically, is what we did. We had a lot of other clients, too, but, we had, but primarily it was TV commercials. And so the phone would ring. So somebody would call in. We would route the call to somebody's house. And the agent would pick up and start reading from a script. And that's how we would, we would, we would sell stuff. And we would record, what the, we would record the order. And, and we, and. Now, um, 
I built data tools there, and, um, but one of the things that was happening was we needed to measure, we had a thing called a CHUP. Does anybody know what a CHUP is? Of course you don't, because it didn't work at Live Ops. <laughs> a, a CHUP was um, a call where the caller hung up before it got to an agent. So somebody rings the phone, um, ring, 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 oh, then no one's gonna answer, I hang up, right? Now, a CHUP was super important to Live Ops, right, because, um, we, 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 the, so that's an attribute of a call, and the measure might be the percentage of callers that hung up. So percent chups. Of all the calls, what percentage of them were chups? If you looked across the day and we saw that this day had a lot of chups, you go, oh, well, let's see if we can locate it by hour. And then we might find a half an hour where we had a lot of chups in that half hour, when that could mean a couple of things, right? It could mean we didn't have enough agents so that people, people were, got tired of waiting and hung up. It could be that we had a telephony problem where one of the switches wasn't routing properly and people hung up. It could mean a lot of things, but it was, an it was a measure that we used to try to figure out whether something was going right or something was going wrong. And over time, we developed another measure called CHUP20. Like, okay, who knows what CHUP20 is? CHUP20 is a, is a CHUP that was longer than 20 seconds. And because, <laughs> right? So this is the kind of language that you develop, and everybody, knew what a, everybody at LiveOps would know what a CHUP20 was, because a CHUP20 indicated an agent problem more likely and a staffing problem more than it likely indicated a switch problem. A, chup, a, a, a series of CHUPs might indicate a telephony problem, but a CHUP20 was, yeah, we didn't probably have enough agents online. Right? So, so those kinds of measures and those are, are how you can use to, to control your business. And then being able to examine, cross-examine why you had it. So, okay, I know that during this period of time it happened. Was it a telephony switch? Was it a staffing? Was it a particular commercial that these were being routed for? You, know, you could look at the data in lots of different ways to cross-examine what was going on to try to figure out what was, what, what was happening with the business. Um, suppose, I'll give you another example, which I, this one I like. Um, Suppose you're a, re a manager of a restaurant, okay, and, you, and you're trying to figure out a, me you, you're, you're looking around the room and it's busy and you wanna know whether or not you're delivering good service. Is there good service happening right now? Now, um, there are a couple of ways you could do this. You could walk up to each table and you could say, are you getting good service? Are you getting good service? Bad, because it's probably intrusive. It, it probably affects the customer experience itself, so it's not a, it's a, it's, it's a Heisenberg problem. You can, but just by asking, you ruin the experience. <laughs> um, so, but what, what we're looking for is something like a CHUP, which we can look around quickly and see whether or not we are having a problem right now. Right? That's a good measure. That's a good, we're looking for some kind of a proxy for service about whether or not the, that we're getting good service. And um, there are a couple of ways to do it. My favorite way of measuring is to look around and see the water glasses. Now, if the water glasses are, when, when things are, when, when a restaurant is quiet, the water glasses are likely full because the, 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 the servers don't have a lot to do. They just, they look around, they see the problem, and if they're good, they'll, they'll fill up the glasses. Um, but if, as it starts to get busy, they start to take more orders. They can, that's the, it's the last thing that they're gonna do, and they never get to it, and then the, the service drops. Now, the, the, what you want to do in that case is that you want to bring on more service if you can. You want to call people back in from break. You want to not let people go on break. You want to, you want to try to increase the service so that you can get through this rush and then let people off. What the wrong thing to do is to try to fix the measure. If you go around and you tell the servers to go fill the water glasses, you've lost your ability to measure whether or not you're busy. And so this is really important. You don't want to fix the measure. You want to fix the problem. right? And so over-observing, so you have to be careful, like a CHUP20 is something that we want to reduce, that's okay to reduce, but a water glass being half full, you want to be careful of because it's really a tell more than it, it, it the tell might be more valuable than, than, um, than fixing the problem. Um, well, so there's my glass, sorry. <laughs> um, an another example I'm gonna give is, so, so Amazon, um, I don't have any direct experience with this, so I'm making this up, but I'm, so just, just being clear. It's, it's just through observations of what they might want. If I were Amazon, I would want to increase two things. I want to increase the number of times people buy, and I would want to increase um, the, the amount that they spent, right? So that would be, the, that would be, the, that would be this, the measure that I'm trying to move, right? That's what I want to have. That's, that's the measure that if it goes up, we're more successful. People are buying more often. That's great. So. Um, um, so you have these measures, and then what you do with these measures, sometimes they're not very complicated measures, you build strategy around it to try to figure out um, 
how to, how to move these measures. So that's, so um, like, the, in, like in the restaurant example, what, what strategies could, could we have to increase to increase the fullness of glasses without actually increasing the fullness of glasses. Well, in 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 Amazon, what they're trying to do is make sure people reorder what much. So, who are you, uh, Am in, in the U.S., Amazon Prime is a promise that they will whatever you order will be delivered in two days or less. Um, and so, what Amazon did was they they started and you have to pay seventy dollars for the privilege, which is great. I'm a rational person, so I paid it almost immediately because. I'm impatient and I want to know when my stuff's coming and I'm, I have forethought. And, and so what they did is they, they started, they probably did a test with Amazon. They probably saw that people with Amazon Prime are buying more stuff with it, right? So that, that it does in fact work. Um, but the problem is that not everybody has forethought to say that that's what they really want. I mean, one, one of the things in, when I was studying some behavioral economics was people are really bad at predicting what they're going to want in the future. I, I happen to be able to predict that I care about the shipping, but, but some people might not think that they care that much about it or, or being willing to pay for it. So what they've done recently is they've started to offer video services with, with Amazon Prime. So they, their thesis is that if we get you to try this video service because you're willing to pay for that, you'll like the shipping so much that you'll start to realize that you didn't realize you wanted this, but of course you really want it, and then you'll, and, 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 the, and the, and you'll have more, more people using it. And so pick what measure you want, and then try to figure out what your strategies are for how to move the measure. But the important thing is figuring out what, what, what measure is important and it's specific to your business, and then how do you, met, how do you move it? Be careful not to over not manage to it, and then figure out what language is important for you. So it's all about language. It's all about making new language. Um, finding industry standard measures are fine, but I'm sure that each of you and your companies have your own measures and be, you know, play with them. We invented CHUP20 after we observed a bunch of stuff. So like as you observe things, try, try out these new measures, figure out what's, what works and, um, and, and use those. Um, so, well, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>